guys, and welcome to another episode of Sasquatch Odyssey. Thank you guys so much for wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Take a time out of your busy schedule to join us for the show tonight. We've got a great guest coming up here shortly, but before that, as always, I want to invite you. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please send me an email. You can get me at brian at sasquatchodyssey.net. You can private message me on our Facebook page at Sasquatch Odyssey, or you can get me on Instagram at Sasquatch Odyssey. Like I said, we've got a great guest coming up here shortly. Uh, he's raring to go and ready to get into it. He's had several sightings out there, and he's going to share his encounters with us tonight. So without further ado, Emmett, let's bring you on the show and tell us about your first sighting, buddy. Yes, uh, for, uh, my only sighting I have was uh, in Tennessee, Scott County, which is right there, uh, north, uh, which is uh, north border of Tennessee and Kentucky border. Um, early 20s, a uh, group of friends. We all love hunting, fishing, shooting, camping, and everything like that. We used to take our uh, Thanksgiving weekends, just the guys, and uh, they would, a uh, week or two beforehand, bring me their ammunition, whatever that's going to carry sidearms and rifles and everything, and I reloaded and always made sure everybody had more bounce per ounce in the rounds. And because uh, where we were going was uh, known for wild boar, I call them devil dogs. Because uh, once they get after you, I've had them. I actually tried to uh, uproot a tree that I shimmied up, and so you want to take those out quick, hard, and fast. But yeah, we were all young and full of piss and vinegar, and you know, ten foot tall and bulletproof, and just good old guys and friend of mine he was born up there and his family moved down here in harrison uh and grew up down here's how i got to know him and um he liked to go back there and see uh kinfolk and everything and uh he got with his cousin and his cousin was going to get a good his good friend and we was all going to meet up there in a rustic old cabin uh you can say i'm a country boy i've done it all um and it ain't too much I haven't seen. But when he said rustic cabin, basically it was uh, boards, one by us nailed up around trees. And you can literally stand in front of the cabin and see inside the cabin and out the back side of the cabin from all the, uh, how big the cracks were. Plastics were uh, plastic was on two sides. But we... Uh, Three of us down here decided to go up there. We're in the truck. We're heading up that way. And I never been to that part of Tennessee. It's mountains and out middle of nowhere. And basically, uh, Scotty and uh, Mark and I, we just uh, going up that way. And Mark, who was raised up there, we just you know let him just take us on up there. Well, Onada is the town he's from, and uh, beautiful. Beautiful back countries, uh, beautiful haulers, and just gorgeous up there. And uh, got off the paved road, and we were literally, it seemed, uh, about two hours on a dirt back trail. And come to find out, it was part of an old coal mine strip mining where we were going. And they had this rustic cabin up there. So uh, after driving up through there, after a while, notice that you didn't get to see nobody because we're out in the middle of nowhere. It's God's country. And every once in a while, uh, we would stop and get big old chunks of coal that fell off the back of the coal trucks, and, and we would get them and throw it back to the truck later on for heat. So we get up there to the cabin and we're unloading the coal and un unloading our stuff in the back of this little rustic cabin were four basically bunks uh, nailed in the far back wall. Uh, and there was an old kitchen stove in there that was gas, and there's a bottle of uh, propane there we used, and a buck stove that we threw the coal in. So, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and this place was located on top of Ridge Line, and the wind was blowing pretty good. And then later on, that friend of mine, Mark, his cousin, and his best friend, Wayne and Porter, they showed up. And you can hear them coming about 20 miles down off the mountain because that old Jeep rattled and flapped all the way up there. And I thought, well, there goes all the deer. 
we're going to hunt because I know it scared everything out in the next three counties over. So they showed up. We all got settled in, and it was getting dark, so we was going to hit the next morning. And I was asking them where all we're going to go, and they said, well, we're going to go down here off the bottom of the mountain over to the foot of the other mountain over here, and whoever wants to hunt the bottom can hunt the bottom down the uh, little bitty uh, hollers down there in the fields, or we're going to go up here on the ridge line on the other mountain. All right. Next morning, we all get up, get something to eat, check our gear, make sure everybody's loaded up and got everything you need, and we take off in, in the big truck, Mark's big old Ford. He had a camper top shell on the back of it and had the window open up in between where we communicate. So there's two in front and three of us in the back with the gear. Well, we come off the mountain rattling around, and we go through part of... Uh, Oneida, and uh, pop out there at the bottom of the next mountain we're going to go up to, and it's a pretty little field. I say it's probably about 200 yards long, maybe about 75 yards wide, and the road went right beside it, and on the other side of the field is just straight up woods, and there was a stream right there at the bottom. But the road went down and hung a hard right at the end of the field, and that stream went underneath that road. Well, uh, Porter, Mark's cousin, his buddy wanted to be dropped off there. And he had a semi-automatic Russian-type rifle. i never seen it before, but after later on, you know, uh, the years going by, they became a very popular weapon to, you know, to use. And he had his tree stand. So we dropped him off, asked him if he was going to be all right. And he goes, yeah. So we took off up the mountain and spent all morning up there hunting and taking naps. When that sun came out and hit you, you know, we didn't have tree stands or anything. We were just all just all over the mountain. We would find an opening that little hollers and whatever. And we told, uh, told him what time. Later on, you know, that evening was going to be down there to pick him up to be there. So, you know, we spent all day hunting. Everybody separated, but in a good shot distance from each other, you know, in case they might get anything to help, get help dragging it out and everything. I would like to say at this point in time in my life, only thing Bigfoot was to me. I never seen any films or any pictures or anything like that. The only thing I could relate Bigfoot to is just what you would hear in movies or something like that. And mainly it was out West Coast, Northwest. And uh, I think one time I saw it on television, I think it was a $6 million man had a fight with Bigfoot at one time, you know. But, you know, I was a kid. Didn't even think anything of it. I've seen bear. I've seen wild hogs. I've seen black panthers. I have seen cougar. I've seen anything you could possibly see in these woods. I've heard bobcats sound like females being tortured to death. And I've heard whippoorwills, you know, all of Mother Nature sounds. When we got through hunting and we were coming off that mountain, and we pulled up on that road right beside the field where we dropped off Wayne. He wasn't there. And you could see where the grass was pushed down where we dropped him off that morning because he had to cross a ditch off that road. And go, and there was a thicket of uh, privet or box hedges, brush, whatever you want to call it, that went down between that road and that field. And even... When that road turned to the right at the end of that field, it kind of, the road kind of went up because that um, creek stream ran underneath that road. Well, we realized he went there, and the brush and everything was so thick, and, and we're right in the road. So we decided to go on down that road where it hung to right at the end of that field, and it's kind of up high, and the field continues on the other side of the road with the stream. And we turned the truck around, and we're just sitting there up there on top of the road, looking down in the stream that's flowing underneath us, and we're dropping rocks, you know, guys do. 
and who could hit what or whatever. And all of a sudden, one of them slipped up and hollered, hey, there's Porter. I mean, there's Wayne. And we looked up, and he's coming right out of the woods, and it's steep, coming off that mountain. And he's coming out across that field, and he's walking over towards that road, part of that road we said we'd pick him up at. We're waving and everything like that, and apparently he don't see us or what. And he's about 200 yards down. Now, this is a beautiful grass field. Grass is about waist high because we're at that end. So we know about how high that grass is, and it's, you know, waist high on on him down there. And he's walking across. All of a sudden, he takes off running. Now, when I say running, I'm not talking about a trot. I'm talking about full lean into the wind, arms pumping, chunking it. And we all went, what in the world's going on? <clears throat> As he gets halfway across that field, all of a sudden, out of the woods, where he came out from, we saw this big black image come out of the woods. Now, he's already halfway across that field, pumping it, running as hard as he can. And this image, if you hold your pinky and your right arm out as far as you can, picture that's Wayne. This image coming out of the woods, black, your left hand, put your index and your middle finger together, and that's compared to the size. Now, I'm getting Wayne and Porter mixed up because this has been a while. But it's Wayne who's out there. And he's not a small guy. I'm six foot, and he's a little bit bigger than I am. And like I said, he's running hard as he can. This thing comes out of the woods and running straight towards him. It has a lean to it. Not an upright, like a person would run, but more of a forward lean. <clears throat> Only thing defined about this is it's big, it's black, obvious, it has hair on it. There's no clothing, no markings of anything like that. It's just solid going after him. We immediately turn around, and some of us said some other words, and we we're going to reach in the back of the vehicle and grab the weapons to draw a bead down whatever was chasing Wayne. Well, as he was going across that field and how fast this thing was catching up to him, we knew by the time he got to that brush line over to the uh, road, that's when it was going to get there at the same time. I already had my weapon in my hand, and I said, forget about it. Jump in the truck. Let's go, 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 go. Piled in the cab, piled, just jumped in the back of the truck, left the tailgate down, and the camper top, shell top, you know, left it open. And Mark just starts squealing around there, and, you know, we're 200 yards down. You come, we come ripping up, Mark locks it down in that truck, and we jump out ready to level anything. And we look over, and there's Wayne sitting down there in that ditch, not breathing heavy, not out of breath, and he's seen us how we had our weapons and how we were ready just to you know, wide eyed and, you know, and just fix to go at it. And two, uh, two of us already set a perimeter for, you know, uh, security basically around. Cause we didn't know what, where, when, or how we are just, and he's just sitting there all cool, calm, collective. And we started buzzing with questions left and right. Are you okay? What in the hell was that? Um, uh, and then he and, and then he was confused, and he was asking us, "What are you talking about? What are you talking about?" Well, we all finally calmed down and told him what we saw, and that was him. And he goes, "No, that was not me." And we go, "Wait a minute, You're, we're the only ones out here within ten miles, easy." 
What do you mean that wasn't you run across the field? He goes, that wasn't me. I said, that wasn't you. We did notice that whoever was running across that field did not have a weapon and was not carrying a tree stand. But it was camouflage. But, you know, so we assumed it was Wayne. Well, after he realized how freaked out we all were, and could not believe that he did. I said, you had to have heard something running across that field. He goes, no. He goes, I've been sitting here. I go, how long? He goes, oh, about 15 minutes, which was apparently after we were first there and left, he must just came right through that brush or whatever and didn't see us turn that curve down there waiting on him. And we were just bumfuggled. We, we couldn't figure out what we saw, who else is out there, and what in the hell was that big black fuzzy thing running across a field in that weird um, stooped forward position. Now, we all loaded up, checked the area, made sure, okay, if it was somebody, who's hurt? Because the intent this thing had running was the intent to catch. And what it was going to do after it caught, we didn't know. Um, we we didn't go out in the field, but we looked all through that brush line next to the road, and that was it. I mean, I don't think we, we were surrounded by woods on the other side of the street. Um, and, you know, Wayne, he didn't hear nothing, and we couldn't figure out why. So we all loaded up in the truck, and we started heading back to the cabin. This is the only time these group of guys has ever ridden in a truck that many miles on a backcountry dusty road out in the middle of nowhere, and not one word was said. I'm in the back of the truck. Mark and Porter, their cousins, they're in the cab, and like I said, we had that little window open in the back. Nobody ain't saying nothing. And by halfway up the mountain, Porter looks back at me and he goes, Emmett? I said, yeah, it was. He goes, that's all I need to know. And nobody said another word. We got up the cabin and we all checked our weapons, got inside the cabin. Some of us ate, some of us didn't. Still trying to figure out why all we just saw. Of course, Wayne, he, he knew we were baffled, but you know, and he knew that we knew our way around in the woods, and he knew that we wouldn't shine any moan. Well, I looked at a friend of mine, and uh, Scotty, and I told him, I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. My pistol is going to be with me tonight. So when when you guys saw these two things running across the field, the, the original smaller what you thought was a person, you thought it was Wayne running across the field. And then this, this much larger, I was literally sitting in my studio when you were describing it, putting my pinky on my right hand out and my index finger and my, my uh, middle finger out on the other one to, and that's a huge difference in size from, you know, hundred, 200 yards away. I mean, w- once this all happened and you guys caught up with Wayne and you saw that, Hey, he's not out of breath. He hasn't been running. That clearly wasn't him that you saw. Looking back now, in retrospect, what what do you think you guys saw? Do you think you possibly saw a smaller Sasquatch and a larger Sasquatch? Do you think it might have possibly been another hunter that this thing was chasing that wasn't a part of your your group? Uh, what what do you think was actually going on at the time? We analyzed, we dissected, and every time it seemed that night in that cabin which was eerily quiet because you could see everybody's wheels turning, to try to come up some kind of logical explanation, what all did we witness? Was it paranormal? Or are we losing it? Are we crazy? And yes, I will tell you, there was no alcohol on this trip or anything else. But every time somebody would bring up like a scenario or case, we no, uh-uh. You know, somebody go, no, mm And... We were not second guessing. We we were just, in a nutshell, bumfuggled. I mean, we just couldn't figure it out. 
only later on, well, when this whole hunting uh, trip was over with, nobody brought it up for at least 30 more years. Um, nobody said anything. Uh, it was years after I was married to my wife before I brought it up to her. But the whole time in the cabin that night, <clears throat> we couldn't figure it out. But I told Scotty, I said, I'm sleeping with my weapon because we're out here in the middle of nowhere. Don't know where I'm at. If anything goes on, you know, we got to bug out or something. The only thing we know is follow this road off the mountain. And then when we do that and get paved road, you're still out of wherever but we just couldn't you know um i ain't gonna say which one but uh one of us in the group was kind of losing it that night um it got to him real bad and every little noise we heard outside of that little cabin uh first night everybody's full of laughs and you know jocularity and have the good old time or something like that but that night it seemed like um well the first night we heard a pack of coyotes down there off the ridge right below us and as obvious as a den that had uh there were some pups involved well this after this happened that night they sounded off and that was just one to the thing that just set one of our other buddies off and um we all just had to just uh, depend on each other that we're going to be safe and, you know, it didn't matter. And we knew that we just dro- change the subject, drop it, and just get on through the night much as we can. Well, later on that night, in the back of the cabin, there were four racks, basically just wooden pallets, you know, nailed to the back wall. You can either put a shelving you know, or you put your sleep bag back in there or whatever. But uh, Porter and Wayne, um, they were in cots in their sleeping bag next to that buck stove, all that coal that we accumulated on the way up the mountain. They kept chunking it on there. And uh, I don't know. I guess they were still part in shock or something. I don't know because they were freezing to death. We were burning up. And we were in the back part of the cabin, and the whole cabin's not big at all. It's probably about, I don't know, 15 by 20, if that, you know. And um, But the wind's blowing through, and we're on top of this ridge out in the middle of nowhere, so that wind's just cutting through like you wouldn't believe. But we're laying back here in our racks on top of our sleeping bags, Um uh, because they keep throwing so much coal in that buck stove, it's glowing red, and we're burning up. Well, we finally get to sleep and everything, and I couldn't tell you what time of night it was or anything, but I heard something. And I thought, what in the same world? And I kind of rolled over, and from the glow of the buck stove, you know, because I had a little window right there in front of the door, you know, the flames, I could see Porter and Wayne, in in their uh, bear, you know, in their bunks and everything, you know, on the cots. And I look down below me, and I see uh, Mark and Scotty in their racks. And uh, I thought, who in the world is that outside walking around? I went, no, I can't. You know, I, I'm I'm hearing this wrong. It's it's nobody. You know. And uh, so I roll back over, and I hear it again. I thought, well, I know it ain't going to be, you know, a deer, you know, because, you know, obvious humans are up here. It's probably a possum or, you know, something like that mess around out there. And then I noticed whatever it was was bipedal. It did not have four legs. And how the moon was out that night, and I'm up back against the cabin facing the cracks out the back of the cabin towards the woods. 
the moonlight coming through with the clouds, you know, every once in a while you get a good stream of light. I saw a shadow, but I couldn't identify it. And the only thing I can think to myself was, is there's only a uh, three-quarter inch of wood between me and whatever that is out there. And if it reaches in here and grabs me, it's fixed to get lead poisoning. And I had my magnum uh, next to my chest just pointing right out there at that crack. And I thought, if I get a good identification of whatever that is out there, I'm going to pop it. But I wanted a good identification. But it eventually um, left. It didn't come around the other side or the front of the cab. It just stayed on the back side, which was going down the ridge off the very heavy wooded side opposite from the road. And it left. And I knew right then that uh, that it, you know, we, we were in somebody else's backyard and we were not welcome. How far from where you guys saw these things running across the field were you in relation to the cabin where this is taking place? It's just on the outskirts of Oneida, uh, which is really not a big, well, at the time now, it's like, you know, this, all this happened in the mid 80s, 1980s. So that's how long ago this happened. And uh, so I imagine when I was grown, I haven't been up there since then, but it was on the outskirts. And I think the name of the road was Buffalo Road, Buffalo. Yeah, I think that was it. And, uh, you know, that that's basically been the – and I've been up there oh, not a multiple times to deer hunt. That was the last time I've been up there and the last time I've been up in those woods. Just going back to the the siding where these things were running across the field, I know it was, you said, what, 150, 200 yards away. Could you estimate the size of the bigger of the two things that you saw running? If you if you had to put a height and a weight estimate on what you saw, could, could you give us an idea? Well... Yeah, um, I can give you a pretty good idea. Uh, back in the mid '80s, I was Hampton County Sheriff's Department and uh, did ambulance and volunteer firefighter, and so you know I'm pretty good at checking out situations of people and stuff like that. That field had grass; it was waist high to us. That big fuzzy thing running across the field you could see the knees coming up above the grass line. It was, it was, um, mid thigh or lower. That's how big it was. Uh, to us, it was about waist high to it. It was right above the knees, you know, uh, cause you could see the legs, um, the knees bending above the grass line as it, you know, took each step. The smaller person or whatever, um, it was like us. It was ways to chest high on them, too. And you said something earlier. Now, I thought of this, but it's just, you know, me. Was that a person or maybe a smaller squatch? And when I said that it looked like it was camouflaged, uh, after... Thinking about it, um, it could have been, to be honest with you, because it's been so many years, and um, since you, you know, re- you know, wanted me to come on the air, I've been um, opening up files in my mind that have not been opened up in years, and um, situations I forgot about that until today about that thing coming back behind the cabin where I was trying to sleep. I didn't think about that till today. Well, it's certainly and, understandable. It was over 30 plus years ago. So, you know, well, when, you, when you were describing a lot it, of it out, exactly, exactly. And we, and, and to be such a terrifying experience because you thought something was definitely chasing down one of your buddies that was about to take him out. I can, I can only imagine what that was like. So, but when you're describing it and you're talking about how fast the bigger of the two things that you saw running was running, I thought, well, 
it's possible it may have been something that was just as fast as it was because it would have probably overtaken it um, had it not been a, a smaller Sasquatch. I mean, who well, knows? The reason, yeah, the reason why I thought it was, uh, you know, uh, Wayne out there because he was in the middle of that field when we noticed him, and then he started running. So he started running at midfield, and this thing came out running. So and it was closing in on him fast. So by the time we figured he got to that brush line by the road, that's when it was going to be all on top of him. I got you. Okay. And I knew it wasn't a bear because bears do not run up on two legs. Exactly. I know because I have been chased by a bear before in Cage Cove. So, you know, uh, I knew, we knew it wasn't bear. But, you know, when you, when you said that it could have been a smaller squatch, something like that, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no because it doesn't make sense to how we went around there and Wayne wasn't out of breath. He was more or less just sitting there in that grass, in that ditch, waiting for us to come. Or, you know, his, the only thing he was missing was a good cigar and a good drink. <laughs> definitely and, uh, definitely not a guy who had just ran from a Sasquatch, right? Exactly. You know, or ran, period. And uh, But, you know, that, that whole – we didn't talk about that for eons, and, um, and it's still like a uh, – touchy subject we we really don't talk about it um i've I've had some uh since you know communicating with you about coming on the air it's it's tried you know over the years um i found out that whenever you bring up the subject of that and i even here recently brought up the subject of bigfoot and everything to a close family member uh you know, it's just, no, there's no way or anything like that. And I tell people all the time, you can believe what you want to believe. I figured they were out there, but figured it was out northwest. But after that day right there, my whole attitude changed about the woods. Now, to bring back today, recent, <coughs> excuse me, my wife and I, we, uh, go into the North Carolina mountains, we got two mining areas in western North Carolina. And we dig up rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and gold. We have dug gold up in Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina. Uh, we have found emeralds. We have found rubies. We have found sapphires, moonstone, you name it, we've got it. And what we do, this is, she's a uh, a teacher and I'm a machinist by trade and we do this in our spare time just get away from everything and the parts of the mountains we go to there's no cell signal matter of fact one of our mining areas you're lucky to get an hour and a half of direct sunlight because how tall the mountains are and how deep down in between the mountains we are and we've got streams that are running hard and fast and in between one ridge going up and the other ridge going up is probably 30 foot apart where the stream is. And the stream is about, goes anywhere it's 10 to 15 foot wide, runs shallow or it runs deep whenever it's, the water's backed up. But we go up there and we get in streams and uh, we classify whatever we can and, you know, we find things. Well, this one area we love to go to and we got two big streams blending into one and we have a huge waterfall now you got a lot of small waterfalls all up and down these little streams and when you're in the stream even at five foot you got to scream at each other because that's how loud the water is and i got a dog and i tell everybody it's my bear dog because there's so much thick undergrowth and brush and Mount Laurels and everything there, I usually smell a bear before you see him. And I, it always worries me that a bear coming down, just coming down through there off these ridges because it's steep, 
And if a bear stumbles upon you and it's surprised, there's no telling what it's going to do. But if a bear is coming around and he knows he can hear and smell you, he'll avoid you. But it always worried me about that. I always told my wife, don't get too far away because if I have to draw down on a bear and it's between me and you, I can't take the shot. But where we're at and where we stay at, I can look up both these streams to a certain point, and I always tell my wife, don't go past these points where I can't see you. And when we first get there and unpack everything, I'm more out from the drive, and I just want to take it easy, and that water just rocks me to sleep, especially right beside that waterfall when I just get out there and take a good nap. My wife loves to hit streams and find everything. One time I was asleep, and she came in, and I looked at her and I go, what's wrong? She goes, the weirdest thing's been happening to me out there. I go, what? She goes, these big rocks um, keep going into the stream. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, <clears throat> excuse me. She goes, I'm out there in that water, and it can be deep or shallow, wherever she's at. And she goes, a rock just goes right into the stream. I go, well, is it rolling down from the ridge or anything like that? She goes, no, it's being thrown. I go, what do you mean? She goes, I'm out there. And she goes, I can hear it go thump in deep water. There's nobody around us. I mean, nobody. And like I said, many years ago, my wife kind of, you know, uh, 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 about my first beer, Bigfoot experience, you know, so I just looked at her and said, well, okay, you know, it could, you know, it could be a limb or something. She goes, no, these are rocks. Are you sure? She goes, yeah. She goes, cause they still have moss on them. Well, moss don't grow on rocks. It's in, underwater. I go, well, okay. So I learned right then, all right, maybe bears are not the only thing I need to keep an eye out for. One time we had our daughter and our grandson up there, and I go to bed early. And they're out there on the patio area right beside the waterfall, and it's pitch black. Up there in the mountains, there's no street lights, there's no nothing, and it's hard to get any moonlight because we're way down in between these two mountain ridges. So the only light we got is right there on our patio, and if there's anything out from around the perimeter of the patio, you really can't see. I'm back there asleep, more well, just about about asleep, and all of a sudden, my wife, daughter, and grandson, and the two dogs come busted in, screaming and hollering. My first instinct is I learned one thing: always have a very, very bright flashlight. And keep your big bore weapon next to you. I jumped up. I go, what's wrong? And my wife told me that something ran right past them on that patio and hit the stream. And I went, what? And she told me, well, where we stay at, we have eight foot tall privacy fence. So there's no way that any straggler or whoever coming off the main road can get to where we're at. It's, it's secured. It's set for the mountains. And right there, but to that property, is Nath Hale and National Forest. So I go out there with that big flashlight, and I look around. And, you know, it's the middle of the night. It's dark. You really can't tell anything. I said, all right, y'all, just come on in. You know, no big deal. Next morning, I get up, and I go out there, and I look. And there's this huge... Well, it's a boulder. It's not a rock. It's a boulder. And I knew where it's always been. You can't move it because it's a boulder. But it's been moved. My wife said the night before, whatever went running right beside the patio and they couldn't see, that it hit something. And they and she said it sounded like it just tore half the uh, stream bed down as it hit the water. On the other side of that stream... You know, the stream is about 12 foot wide right there. The ridge goes up, and you cannot climb it unless you have a rope. Plain and simple. Too much loose leaf, and, you know, air, and it's so steep that there's no way unless you have a rope. I got down there and looked around to see where that big old boulder's been moved. 
And I looked at other things, pretty good size, that's being moved as it bulldozes its way through. Bear won't do that. <clears throat> you hear a bear, but a bear will not move a boulder or all the other stuff that got knocked down there. And the only thing I can figure out that makes sense to me is it was snooping around and they were probably out there with the light off <coughs> and flipped it on real quick, just, you know, being goofy or whatever. And it was being nosy and came around the corner. And when they flipped the light on and it startled it just as much as they got startled. But after that incident right then, I purchased a FLIR camera. Uh, I told everybody that I bought it for bears. Bears ain't going to do nothing at night except for getting your, you know, scraps or something like that. But that area between the rock throwing, and we're talking about uh, grapefruit-sized rocks, and all that stuff they got pushed down to the uh, stream bed that scared, you know, my wife and kids, that uh, no deer, no bear mm -mm, would do that. And another mining area we have is off of 64, Western North Carolina, between Hayesville and the Appalachian Trail. It's called, uh, the mountain's called Chunky Gal. And the first time my wife and I went up there with some friends, uh, we had our grandson with us. And I was checking the area out to see if it would be a good mining area because it's known for garnets and sapphires and rubies. Well, everybody's up on top of the ridge on, on this mountain, and you can drive up there. It's kind of like a forestry service road. I kind of went down off the side of the mountain to check, uh, you know, just snooping around. My wife and grandson was up there, basically everybody else, digging around and everything. And I was walking down off this mountain, and every once in a while I'll stop and look back behind me, and I can see my wife and grandson up there. And after a while, I got so far down that mountain, I couldn't hear them, and I could barely see them. And I figured that's probably about far down as I needed to go. But I noticed where I was going, I was going down to a the bottom on this ravine, and... uh I thought it was kind of odd that there's nothing around. Uh, I didn't see no rabbits, no squirrels, you know, and usually in a situation like that, you would see some kind of critters. And I couldn't understand why, you know, but I was looking for some good samples, and I was taking samples from uh, rocks that have been disturbed from falling and everything like that. And I also found out found where somebody else has been doing a little mining down there and they actually had it booby trapped so i kind of luckily came in on the right angle on it because you know nothing was tripped and i backed my way back out and as i was swinging back out down and around i got close to that brush down through there and i just had a feeling i was being watched didn't know you know i could pick up on things you know and i really couldn't understand that my wife don't even know about this and uh there was something big that moved in that brush. And I just told myself, that's a bear just going on top of the mountain. But after I started going up, on my way back up, I looked back down, and the trees that I saw shaking, I went, no, uh-uh. That, you know, unless that bear is scratching the hide off himself, he wouldn't be rubbing the trees like that. And I couldn't hear anything and just see those trees just shaking down in that thick brush. And I was up high enough where I could see almost down on top of it. But if so, thick, I couldn't see nothing. I thought, okay, you're letting me know. So, you know, I, I just backed on out of there and started doing some research and checking out. And that area of six, Highway 64 going through that pass up there around the Appalachian Trail, and uh, we got home, and I told my wife, I said, look here. And she said, what are you looking this up for? I said, I, I'm just out of curiosity. And I got looking, and uh, yeah, it's it, I didn't know it before, but yeah, that seems, seems to be Bigfoot Central right through there. Wow. So 
let me ask you this: when when your wife, you said she she, when you told her about your first encounter, when you guys had seen what you saw back on the hunting trip, she was kind of eh. I'm not so sure about that. What I'm just curious: what what did she think? when the rocks were being thrown and she had that experience did she ever come around and say hey maybe that's what this is or did she have some other explanation or how did how did she process that well at first you know she was kind of we would get up there in those streams and just the rock throwing is not the uh, only thing um we'll be up there and we would hear whistles like i said the water is loud there's so many waterfalls and the water, you know, the, the terrain is so steep and how that water is just coming down through there. It's loud. And we would hear whistles and every once in a while she would catch me or I would catch her. We're in the streams and we would catch each other looking around. And then when we would make eye contact, we'd look at each other and go, did you hear it? No, but you know, then we know the other person did. And we also would, feel and hear big thuds now when i'm talking about big thuds we first started relating to them like somebody beating a bass drum just boom but after a while it's sounding more like somebody's picking up a huge metal dumpster and dropping it off a 20-story building because you can feel it in the ground, and you can hear that low, and it would resonate. What, what do you think those and, noises were? You know, you would try to reason them off like maybe through this water current, and I have heard this, rocks moving on top of other rocks through the water, and you hear that little clank clock clink clock you know sound you know of rocks being moved because we're moving material you know and but the 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 you know boom you know is there a jet flying over sonic you know but then it it's it happens not on a regular schedule where you can sit your watch by but we'll be out there prospecting all day and we'll hear it three to four times and the next day you go out there, it won't be at the same time or anything like that. It'll just be just different. You know, it just, it's just enough to where when you get through doing what you're doing, you just kind of lean back to take a break or I'll, you know, uh, smoke my pipe or something like that, you know. And no, not the funny stuff, this is tobacco pipe. <laughs> um, you know, you know, and you relax, that's when you pick up on it. Now, we had some friends go up there with us one time, and we never said anything. And uh, we were up there, and they were they were getting in the gym and, and digging for stuff and everything like that. And we got back to our place there by the waterfall, went cleaning up to go have supper. And she asked me, she goes, who's 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 that person up on top of that ridge hiding behind the trees? And that's when I kind of knew right then, all right, you know, she's, she's seeing them. And they, after a while, started picking up on the sounds. Because uh, they was asking us, you know, uh, matter of fact, her husband asked me, is there anybody, is there, uh, uh, I think he asked me, is there a landfill right here where they're dumping huge truckloads of, you know, of dumpsters or whatever? I said, no, uh-uh, there ain't nothing like that around here. It's so strange. I've I've heard stories of of people talking about weird mechanical type sounds that they hear in the woods that that are miles and miles and miles away from from civilization, and it just doesn't make sense. Like a a car door closing in the middle of the woods when there's thousands of acres of nothing but woods and no cars around. Um, people describing what they hear it's almost sounds like heavy equipment moving and things like that it's just really really strange that 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 sort of stuff is is seems to be somewhat synonymous with with bigfoot sasquatch sighting so it's fascinating to me as to to what it could be well my wife and i uh out there digging around especially um around franklin north carolina franklin north carolina uh 
at one time uh, held uh, was the seat of the Cherokee Nation. And we would find pottery and streams and arrowheads and stuff like that. And we did a, her and I both a couple years back for Christmas did a DNA uh, genetics thing, you know. And uh, come to find out, and I always loved Franklin area. It always felt like home to me, even that mountain road, Waya, which I found out Native American means wolf. And that's where the red wolves used to be at all the time. But uh, through the genetic DNA, uh, when Dooley's came from Ireland, the group that I, you know, my family came in off the coast of North Carolina and first settled the first plot was basically right there where Franklin's at. So it made sense, you know, why I feel at home. It's like going back home or whatever. But I also have, my wife and I both, we both have Native American, Cherokee in us. And we started doing some research and everything. And east of Franklin is a place called Judicola Rock. Judicola Rock is this huge soapstone boulder. It's flat, and it has all these etchings all through it with a huge line and there's nothing on the other side. And Judicola was a giant that used to roam the mountains. And the legend has it that um, Judicola found out that some Cherokee were going on his side, his land, and he is chasing them out and that he was so great and big that he leaped from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. And when he landed there, he left a handprint on that boulder. And there's a handprint there. Was, there's a huge handprint with seven fingers. And that was Judicola. My wife and I, we started checking out, you know, Native American folklore and everything. But it's not just Cherokee. If you study and research... Native American folklore and their oral history, that's the point. Folklore is one thing. Oral history is another. And a lot of the nations refer to Sasquatch and Bigfoot as um, well, well, like a ventriloquist. They can actually mimic and sound like uh, there's been reports of people calling their dogs and the husband will go off to work and the wife will be doing something and she'll listen and hear her husband out there in the brush calling the dogs. But he's gone to work. I've definitely heard other stories that, that were very similar to that, where the husband would, would call and the wife had, and then they would hear the, her name being called while the husband was gone. So. And it also, if you check the medicine poles or totem poles, that you'll see a figure up there with, uh, what do they call them, perking lips, like, like kissing lips. Mm -hmm. And that is Sasquatch or Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it. But the reason why he has those perking lips or whatever, because they whistle. He's not kissing, he's whistling. And a lot of nations out there have that on their mess and pole or their totem poles. And, you know, so what I did was my wife and I are researching our Native American background and everything like that. And we do powwows and stuff for our, we make jewelry out of the stuff we find. And, um, but got talked to some elders and, uh, <clears throat> talked to one elder on the, on on Cherokee Nation and everything like that, and uh, and some others, and uh, talked to some shamans. And a lot of people say there's no shamans in Cherokee. They're missing people. Call them wherever you want to. And uh, got checking with them and everything. And there is, you know, the history goes back. Far, far oral history. It just goes back way before white man came to the New World. And I just, I just tell people, believe what you want to believe. But I, <laughs> one 
when I'm in the mountains and it gets dark, I got that FLIR camera and I've got four right beside me because I've seen how fast one of these things can move. And I've seen how big they are. And you better have you a good big boar and you better have you a good headshot. I'm not advocating going out there and killing them. If, if I ever see another one, I'll give it a wide berth and get small as I can and blend into the woodwork and go the other way. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm too old and I can't run. I, I definitely think that's a, that's, that's good sound advice. Um, you know, you've got to experience these things, you know, with vocalizations and, and rock throwing and you, you clearly saw something running across the field during the hunting trip many, many years ago. What, what do you think these things are? Okay. I've listened to multiple, uh, television and internet things and, um, be honest with you, I think that they're a wild man. Uh, call them whatever you want to. The Native Americans called them stick people, wild men. Uh, they've been here a way lot longer than we have. I do not believe they're any part of the UFO conspiracy, paranormal, um, different accounts I've heard and not witnessed, but what I've heard in the studying that I've been doing, um, they're not only, they are the prime alpha top of the food chain. They, they, they're hunters. They have to be, and they're not your fuzzy wuzzy Harry and the Hendersons, you know, type ordeal thing. These things have existed through ice ages and everything else. They know those woods like, you know, your bedroom. Um, they are the top predator. They are, uh, I don't know if they're ambush hunters or they use weapons or whatever they do. They Whatever they do, they must do it real well because that's a big body for a lot of protein to stay in it. And I advise people, um, don't do it. If you go out in the woods, don't be alone. If you see one, do not try to confront it. Don't even try to call it, be honest with you. Because the research and everything I've done from the Native American perspective, they're never alone. It's never been a single loner out by itself. Uh, they travel in uh, a band, a uh, clans, what the Native Americans call it. And some nations did have agreements, however they came across with that. You know, an agreement like the Judicola, you stay on this side, and I stay on this side, or whatever. But, you know, it's from the oral history, it just goes back for so long that they've learned to live with them and respect them and leave them alone, and they'll basically leave you alone. You know, white man's been encroaching many a times, and they've always been out and around, and I don't see, you know, they've adapted to what's been going on with the growth of the country and everything. And uh, it, it just, I don't know, it's just every time when I go out in the woods, even in daylight, because I saw that one in daylight, um... You know, it, it, I, it's a new perspective for me. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, man. It's uh, for people that think these things are the friendly, fuzzy forest giants, and they're out banging on trees and whooping and hollering and trying to pull them in. And I'm like, what are you going to do if it shows up? <laughs> I mean, I, I've I've heard lots and lots and lots, hundreds of encounters, and and most of the encounters are not pleasant. You know, seeing it from a distance of 200 yards away or, or whatever is one thing. But, you know, there's there's been people that are 20, 30 yards from these things, and they're they're about to rip people in half. And, you know. Well, it's the same perspective I have with bears. 
a bear that knows you're there and hears you and smears and smells you, they will avoid you. But if you got an elder sick bear that's starving to death and doesn't care, he's hungry and you're on his menu. Like I said, I've been chased by a bear before in Cades Cove and my parents witnessed and my dad told me this is back when I was in my prime. He said that if your heart was skipped to beat, she would have had you. I was hurdling picnic tables and everything. Mm. And back then I was in prime, you know, uh, shape. So uh, nowadays, you know, with bears, you know, it only takes that one rogue, uh, sickly bear to mess up your holiday. And is it really worth to take that chance? You know, um, I always jokingly say, because where we mine at, I always have one one weapon on me and one laid out there on the table. And a friend of ours up there one time, they go, why do you have this one here on the table? I said, well, she, my wife's up there on the screen, you know. And I said, every once in a while, I keep looking down for water. He goes, what do you keep looking for? I said, make sure there ain't no blood. He goes, well, a bear going to get her? I said, well, I'm really not worried about the bears because they try to get to her, keep her from, you know, finding her stone. She's going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually ran into we've been hiking on our we got a 35 acre property here in lenore north carolina and we've ran up on a black bear with two cubs and as soon as she saw us they turned around and scampered off i mean and that was a mama bear and two cubs so bears black bear especially they're they, they hear you see you smell you they're out they're, they're not going to come charging after you like you said unless it's that that one-off situation where it's an old or sick bear that just doesn't have anything to lose and is trying to hang on to survival but sasquatch is a different story man um yeah they're they're the top predator and i'm still i got word down to me about a uh well i know they're not supposed to exist they're they're uh elusive like bigfoot but delta force there's a story I've been trying to get more information on that there was a small town right there at North Carolina and Tennessee border um, where they had problems and the military was called out to dispatch this family of Bigfoots and um, and they did but they lost two of their own uh, guys in the process. Uh, so I'm, I've been trying to find out more info on that cause I'm, you know, that's my neck of the woods and I, and where we do prospect that I have found military, um, remnants, shall I say, hmm. I found, uh, a, a, a belt or well, a half belt of M60 realms. Wow, out mill out middle of nowhere. Now explain that. Yeah, I'm 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 a firm believer that the military has has been on scene several times, and in, in some of the stories that I've heard in, in Sasquatch encounters, they show up with the DNR. They're, they're not in uniform. They don't talk to anybody. They just go out in the woods with dogs and come back a little while later, get in the trucks and leave. So that's that's not something that's uncommon i think for the military to be showing up in places yeah, like yeah that. back back in 2017 our mountain was part of the major fires and matter of fact is only it's is a quarter of a mile from our mining area and uh and after it's all said and done and over with top of the mountain up there while y'all bald there's a they got a tower up there and it's beautiful views and you know just love it up there well we were up there after uh well, they ain't rebuilt the tower, the top of the tower yet. The tower itself is stone, but the top of it's wood. And I don't even think they had it replaced yet. But we were up there and just, you know, we just walking around all that burnt. It's it just, you know, you feel like he's on Mars, you know. It's just all that twisted, you know, brush and everything like that. And, and off the main trail, I was walking on the brow of the ridge up there on top of Wyoming Mountain and just happened to look down. And there are M60 rounds that were still in the metal belt. Now, I've shot M60s before. I've had military training. And once you shoot those, 
they come out of the links, and the links are apart, separate from the casings. Well, the casings were still in the links in the belt. So these were not even, well, they burned up in the fire, but, you know, they were not used at the point. And why are these things up there? I mean. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? Yeah, and, uh, it, you know, just things like that that sit you back and make you go, huh. <laughs> and my wife and I, we have huh, driving up now the mountain and just happen to look over and there's this big mountain stone pillar there that's covered in ivy and right behind that mountain stone pillar of ivy because the road's real narrow and windy going through there so you know you're doing about 35 40 and you pass things without you knowing uh, we just happened to both of us look over at the same time and there are three guys dressed in full camo with full gear with at least uh, eight days of beard and you could tell they're dragging it and they're coming back down for somewheres and what in the world were they doing hmm. who knows man it's fascinating stuff yeah, I just wish that people be honest and let people know what's out there so things do not or people do not get hurt. I agree, man. I agree. That's that's one of the reasons I do this show is is to get people's stories out there and a give people a place where they can come and, and tell their stories without any type of judgment or ridicule and then put the stories out there because not all of them are are great encounters and and for other people to just know hey these things are really out there and you got to be you got to have your head on a swivel and you got to watch your six when you're in the woods because you're not the apex predator out there buddy <laughs> there's there's, yeah, there's something a lot and, bigger and badder than you yeah i just had a big reality check about a couple of weeks ago my son's friends with some people i'm not gonna say who they are he plays the music uh scene up around all this area he's been cross-country tour did the buses and all that and it's like that and there's a guy here that he knows that plays and my son showed me a couple of weeks ago that uh an area pretty close to where we live at they he actually have video of bigfoot and i said they ain't no way my son goes look what he just sent me and he's not putting it out there on youtube or it's like that because he's a well-known how can i say out in the music for him too but he does this as a hobby and my son showed me that video i went oh my god that's exactly and, and, and it was running across this guy's field just like what i just told you about and i was going oh my god you know there and then they went up there and got cast and everything of, of prints and stuff so now I know the thing's just not up there in the mountains. It's down this way in the hall, down in the valleys, which, wow. you know, something that big go where in the world it wants to. Yeah, nothing, nothing to tell it where it can and can't go. I'd love to see the video, man. That'd be awesome to see. Well, I asked my son, is he willing? He goes, well, right now he's, um, you know, he's well known to, in the music scene to where he can have videos and all this other stuff done and everything. My son has too, but um, you know, he's just going to keep it on the down low right now. I totally understand. Well, look, Emmett, I really appreciate you coming on Thank and you. sharing your story tonight, man. I, I, I found it fascinating and, and great, great, great encounters. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please send me an email. You can get me at brian at sasquatchodyssey.net. Um, have a great night, Emmett. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you, and y'all be safe. And just remember, you know, you're not the only one out there. 